So today's uh, lecture will cover seismic forces, the second half of the lecture on lateral forces. We looked at wind uh, in the last lecture. Uh, wind, of course, operating uh, laterally or uh, against the section of a building. Seismic forces also typically considered a lateral force, but we'll talk today about why seismic forces are slightly different than wind forces and how we have to have a slightly different strategy to deal with them even though the forces are coming in the, in the same direction. Earthquake forces are much greater than wind forces. They're, of course, uh, not as consistent. They happen very uh, relatively infrequently, but when they happen, they unleash an incredible amount of energy and they cause a lot of uh, extra load on buildings, uh, loads in very unpredictable directions. And earthquakes can be so powerful that we can't really design for them. Uh, what we try to do instead is we try to uh, find an acceptable range of damage sometimes or an acceptable range of what we call survivability so that even in the largest earthquake we give occupants some chance uh, to, to survive. The, the building uh, hopefully isn't going to collapse as you see here. Um, it may be damaged, it may be damaged very badly, uh, but at least we have a, a building that uh, has, a, has a reasonable chance of surviving a, a, a fairly large uh, quake. There are earthquakes that we simply can't design for, just like tornadoes. Um, we uh, accept that at some point, it's just not economical to design for the absolute worst cases. Uh, instead, we design for uh, a range of earthquakes that the building can anticipate within its lifetime, 100 year uh, earthquakes or so. So firstly, we're interested in the building not collapsing. And we wanna have strategies that mean that uh, even if things like curtain walls, partition walls, doors, windows, uh, even if all of those things are damaged, even if some of those elements are destroyed, that the structural frame is going to maintain its integrity and that the program spaces within a building uh, are going to be survivable. Maybe not usable, uh, maybe not even repairable, but at least uh, a major earthquake uh, isn't going to uh, cause the collapse of a, of a building. We want to make sure that the um, structural elements of a building uh, stay standing, don't fall into a street or uh, onto, onto another building. And of course, we want uh, some, I, some uh, capacity for the building to withstand kind of normal, more pedestrian earthquakes. So typically a, a, a quake of uh, five or six on the Richter scale, we would expect the building to be usable right away. Greater than that, Richter scale seven or uh, eight or above, then we're looking for survivability. Uh, we're looking either for the chance to come back and repair the building, uh, or at least for the building to, to remain standing and not uh, collapse into a street uh, or onto a neighbor. We're most concerned with uh, earthquake resistance in, of course, active seismic zones. And these are fairly well known, uh, the Middle East, Western China, and what's called the, the so-called ring of fire, the Pacific Rim where tectonic plates meet uh, where they rub against each other as they're moving, build up energy and release that energy uh, in these uh, kind of cata sometimes cataclysmic events. And you can see that um, we associate seismic regions with places like uh, Alaska, uh, Iran, Western China, Japan, uh, California. In the United States, North America, the, the west coast of California uh, and Mexico, uh, as well as the kind of southern coast of Alaska are the, are the most well known of these. And we have uh, a, a kind of well-known seismic zone map where we look at the relative hazard of seismic activity. And as you can see, California off the charts. Um, but if you look closely, you can see that uh, in the middle of the country under uh, a fault in southern Missouri called the New Madrid Fault, we also have a very, very high hazard seismic zone. And in fact, the largest earthquake measured in, continental, in the continental United States uh, excluding Alaska, happened on this fault uh, in the early 19th century. So it's not only confined to the traditional places. You can see that we even have some uh, seismic risk in uh, places like New York City, uh, northern New England. When an earthquake occurs, that release of energy when uh, plates slide past each other or when they catch uh, and release suddenly can happen in any direction. So they can go left to right, front to back, uh, or up and down, and any one of these uh, movements can be uh, fairly random. The acceleration, 
uh, and what we call the amplitude or the, the, the rhythm, uh, the, the, the timing of it, um, can't really be knowable. Earthquakes also go back and forth. So they shake left and right or back and forth, up and down. Uh, and therefore, in addition to the lateral force that we deal with uh, in wind design, we have basically a vibrating action, right? And it's this back and forth that can make earthquakes particularly destructive. We're not so worried about buildings moving up and down. We've already designed for those with gravity systems. It's this side to side movement and particularly this rhythmic side to side movement uh, that concerns us so much. When a building moves or accelerates, um, the forces within it are inertial. So the ground moves and the building, because it's heavy, is slower to move than the ground. And this is what puts loads or forces onto a building in an earthquake. These forces can be transmitted uh, down through the foundation. We can use shear walls or braced frames, just like we do with uh, with, with uh, wind, but we also have other ways that we can deal with this inertial force by, uh, what we, by isolating the building from its foundations, seemingly counterintuitive, but I'll explain why this makes sense here in a minute, um, or by putting actual shock absorbers into the frame that, that dampen uh, these inertial forces using pistons and viscous liquid or sometimes uh, friction. If we don't design for these, then that energy is going to be released and it's going to be released by the structure uh, actually fracturing. Uh, the the, the um, concrete or masonry or wood or steel is going to get pushed past uh, its allowable strength uh, if we have these big inertial forces. And what we'll find is that instead of a dedicated seismic system handling these, the building will act as a shock absorber itself. And this, of course, you see on the lower right is something that we, we absolutely don't want. So one problem that we run into that may have nothing to do with how well the, the building structure is designed is what's called liquefaction. This happens when we're building on soil with a lot of water in it. And when that uh, soil gets shaken by an earthquake, it's just like if you have a bucket with sand and water in it. The soil uh, loosens up, the water ends up between the, the grains of soil. And basically, instead of putting the building on a, a solid bit of ground, you're trying now to float the building. And this, as you can see, doesn't always work. Uh, in fact, um, uh, th this kind of very, very wet soil is a real problem in seismic zones because of this liquefaction problem. Here you can see some housing blocks that, funnily enough, seem to have been designed with an adequate lateral, uh, lateral system, right? The buildings themselves have come down intact, and you can imagine that the lateral forces, when that one in the middle hits the ground, are, are pretty intense. The problem here is a foundation failure. The, the soil uh, in an earthquake suddenly has no capacity to carry the building and just the slightest imbalance or the slightest lateral force actually sends the building uh, over, right? It kind of rotates uh, down in, into, the, into the ground. Another famous example of this was the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. Uh, a neighborhood in the city of San Francisco called the Marina District where uh, the soil liquefied during the earthquake. And this was exacerbated by uh, a, a long-standing kind of retrofit that many of the buildings had undergone where owners had come in and in these kind of 1910, 1920 buildings, they had taken out walls in the lower stories to build garages. And this, you remember from our uh, conversation about wind forces, this created what's called a soft story. So again, you see these rigid upper stories that have literally just sort of rotated down. The, the bottom stories have gone from rectangles to parallelograms. This has been exacerbated by weak uh, soil and therefore foundations that aren't really doing their job. And so even though those upper stories are, if not quite intact, like surprisingly uh, holding together, um, the building collapses because of a, a, a soft story uh, and the uh, effects of the liquefaction of the soil underneath. When an earthquake happens, uh, remember it's the ground that's moving, right? So the, the building is actually tending to stay in place because it's heavy, it has a high inertial mass, uh, and the connection between the building and the ground actually becomes the problem. Uh, the ground moves, the building moves with it, but moves at a slower pace than the, than the earth at first. So we have to either absorb or disperse the energy of the earth moving and trying to pull the building with it. When the earth moves, inertia dictates that a heavy object is gonna to wanna to stay in place, not relative to the ground, but in space. Uh, 
And so when the earth starts to move, the building lags behind it. And as you can see in the, in the diagrams down here, we get the earth moving left to right. The building, the ground floor of the building is moving with the earth because it's directly attached. But because the building is both heavy and any building structure is slightly ductile, uh, the mass itself lags behind the movement of the earth. The real problem comes then when we get this vibration effect, when the earth moves one way, stops, and then moves the other way. And what happens here, now the earth is moving right to left, and you can see that the building, the top of the building has now gone all the way to the right, and now the earth is gonna to start to pull it back. And so the building basically whipsaws in these two directions. Here you can see as we go back and forth, we get what's called a, a period of movement and the building acts like a pendulum. So the earth is moving in a, in a rhythmic fashion. It has a definite uh, a, a rhythm to it, a definite period to it. The building is also moving. The building has its own period that's based on the height of the building and the ductility of the frame. And if the two of those match, what happens is that each movement of the earth actually accelerates the top of the building more and more. The building is whipping back and forth now uh, with harmonic motion. And even in a, a relatively small earthquake, we can get really bad effects on a tall, ductile building uh, that moves back and forth. The building can, in fact, uh, parts of the structure can, in fact, uh, fracture. So here, just to uh, sort of compare this with wind, right, on the left is what's happening in an earthquake. The top of the building is tending to stay in the same place in space. It's the earth that's moving one way or another. And that in some ways is equivalent to wind forces where the earth is staying still, but the wind is pushing the, the top of the building uh, over. The building, of course, doesn't know right where, where the force is coming from. The difference between the two is that the ground movement is going to reverse right, and come back. So the building is going to experience forces that are not only directly related to the seismic movement of the earth, but it's also going to experience this uh, harmonic or pendulum motion, right? Whipping back and forth. When we uh, increase the mass of the building, uh, we're going to get greater acceleration. It's going to take more to move the building, but once the building starts moving, that mass is going to be harder to stop, right? Inertia is working against us now because uh, a, a, an object in motion is going to tend to stay in motion. If the building is stiffer, too, that's going to mean that the building is going to whip back and forth much more rapidly. So even though we, we tend to get worried about buildings moving too much, in a seismic design, we're actually trying to create some extra ductility. We're trying to reduce the stiffness of the building uh, as much as we can so that this whipsaw effect isn't quite as fast or the accelerations aren't quite as fast as they would be if the building was very, very stiff. When we build in a material like concrete or masonry, we're firstly putting heavy material high up into the air, which means that we get these very, very rapid uh, accelerations, right? These, these very, very fast uh, movements because the, the top of the building is whipsawing back and forth. We also get problems with fracture, uh, in particular uh, in shear and in bending. Uh, concrete is a fragile material, and even though we can design it to take tension, in an earthquake we don't really know where that tension is going to be. We don't necessarily know which direction the building is going to move and what parts of a concrete frame really need to be reinforced. So if we reinforce the frame throughout, the building might survive, but a heavy, uh, uh, stiff, and relatively brittle material is the, exactly the wrong thing to use in a, in a seismic situation. A problem that we run into globally is that because concrete and masonry are relatively inexpensive, because they are relatively vernacular materials, we get a lot of buildings that are uh, fragile, stiff, brittle, uh, and very heavy, built in uh, developing parts of the world, some of which are in seismic zones. And so when we see a, a kind of magnitude six or magnitude seven earthquake that kills thousands of people in a country that builds with concrete, this is one of the major reasons that uh, that happens, that we lose that many lives uh, in a country that builds so much out of concrete and what we call unreinforced masonry, 
Whereas here in the United States, that same uh, seismic event uh, probably won't have as high a death or injury toll or a casualty toll uh, because we have codes that restrict what you can do with fragile, fragile brittle materials like concrete or masonry uh, in seismic zones. These are uh, pictures of concrete structures, uh, relatively brittle concrete structures uh, after earthquakes. And you can see failures that we almost never see uh, in, uh, in places with strict seismic codes. So this is a, a sheer failure in a concrete column, um, which is outside of a seismic situation, incredibly rare to see. Similar things here, this building has actually been sheared off of its columns and come down next to it. Here you can see quite clearly the column failing uh, in shear and in bending. And here we have concrete walls, which we normally think of as good uh, protectors against uh, lateral forces. And you can see that these diagonal cracks are very clearly shear cracks, right? That is the wall actually fracturing uh, along its lines of, uh, of maximum shear. You can see too that these are, are typically uh, often reinforced concrete structures. So the reinforcement in them has clearly not been adequate, not to the bending forces that we might expect, but to the shear forces. The weight, the, the mass of the top part of the building uh, and the acceleration literally ripping it off of its uh, columns or, or, or in some cases foundations. As we increase the flexibility of a building, uh, we actually increase the period, the length of time that it takes to go from one side of its uh, seismic motion to the other. And this also slows the acceleration or decreases the acceleration, which limits the damage to the structural frame. Uh, Newton's law, F equals MA, says that the force on a structure decreases as the acceleration and or the mass decrease. So what we're trying to do in seismic situations is we're trying to make buildings that are fairly flexible, that have long period vibrations uh, and low weight. And this is uh, why we rely on steel so much in seismic situations instead of concrete, right? Steel is uh, lighter, it's more flexible, uh, and therefore it is reducing both the mass and the acceleration components uh, of Newton's formula. So it's putting less force uh, onto a building for a given seismic situation. <clears throat> we can do this in, in a few ways, right? We can take steel and we can use it for the entire building frame. Uh, and that limits the amount of uh, mass that we're putting toward the top of the building uh, and creates the ductility we want. So uh, we have one situation where a steel building frame might be just fine. We can also add steel or other vibration controls to actually absorb some of that acceleration itself to put a kind of dampening force into the structure. And we do this with uh, pistons or friction connections as, as we'll see here in a minute. The other things we can do that seem pretty exotic and in some cases really counterintuitive are we can uh, loosen the building's grip on its foundations so that as the earth moves, we have what are called seismic dampers uh, or a base isolation that actually literally lets the earth move and the inertia of the building keeps the building structure in place. Or we can use what's called a tuned mass damper, a very, very large weight at the top of the building that on an oil-based pad or sometimes what's called a slosh tank, just a big tank of water, um, that mass actually stays in the same place in space while the building moves around it. And it's connected to the building structure using sometimes springs or shock absorbers so that the, the tendency of that mass to remain in one place in space while the building is moving around it actually dampens the movement of the upper stories of the building, right? All of these strategies are uh, useful, effective. The simplest and cheapest one obviously is to think carefully about the material that we're using at the beginning of the design process. Uh, and work with something that naturally gives us some protection against seismic forces. Now, you can compare this with what we were talking about when we were discussing wind design, and you realize that we've got a, a kind of paradox here. Um, for wind forces, we actually want a building that's heavy and stiff. We, we don't want the wind to move it very much. We're dealing with relatively light forces, uh, and it does the job to just say we're going to build a kind of heavy building or we're going to put shear walls made of concrete in it. 
that are going to resist the wind uh, through mass. For seismic forces, though, we really want a flexible ductile building to deal with the much greater uh, seismic forces and also this periodicity, right? The, the back and forth uh, of seismic forces that we deal with. So we want, therefore, to be able to safely transfer all of the loads to the ground, wind and seismic, but we want our building frames to be flexible enough that some of the energy from seismic forces uh, is actually absorbed, right? Either through uh, flexibility, ductility, or through one of these uh, kind of add-on bits, tuned mass dampers or seismic dampening that, that, that I just showed. We test these frames uh, not so much by hand. We don't have the kind of rules of thumb. Uh, instead, if we're designing a tall building or particularly long span building, uh, we'll use what's called a shake table and we'll literally put model building structures through seismic events that are scaled down to the, to the size of the model. And today we can program uh, all sorts of historic earthquakes. We have data from some of the larger earthquakes that the buildings have survived. And we can literally put our structural ideas to the test, see how they would have done in, say, Loma Prieta or the Anchorage earthquake uh, in, the, <clears throat> in the 1960s. When we're designing building frames then, once we know kind of how the, the, the frame wants to respond, we can go in and we can very carefully decide where we need uh, ductility and where we need some, some stiffness. Um, steel is almost always going to be the most effective material to use against seismic forces. And most of the uh, high-rise building in California in particular, last 25 or 30 years, has been in steel, even while concrete uh, has taken over in, in, in a lot of the rest of the, of the country. Again, we want the building to absorb some forces, but also to be ductile enough so that it bends uh, and doesn't break. And here you can see, uh, this is called an eccentrically braced frame, um, where we've got a couple uh, pieces of steel here, and you can see uh, what's called a friction connection uh, on, the, on the bits of steel, so that um, as the building tries to move in an earthquake, um, those plates actually rub against the, the steel piece and, and uh, take up some of the uh, energy, uh, take up some of the seismic energy through friction. Here we have basically a giant shock absorber, and that's going to have a, a, a piston inside it, usually a viscous uh, material that's going to also absorb some of that, that seismic energy, right? To, to, so it takes a, a ductile building and then adds some not necessarily stiffness per se, but adds some dampening, right? Uh, something that takes away some of the inertial uh, energy. You can see those are connected here with, uh, with pin connections, right? So that the building frame can deform slightly around it. Um, here, this is the top of Taipei 101, one of the uh, super tall uh, buildings of the last 25, 30 years. And in a, a very serious earthquake zone, Taipei 101 relies on one of these tuned mass dampers. So here's this giant, basically, ball of steel, about a story and a half tall, uh, a huge load to put on the top of the building, something that we typically don't want to do. But notice how it's connected to the building frame. It's connected by this series of pistons and then a series of cables around the top. So that ball is always going to stay, want to stay in the same spot in space even while the top of the building is moving around it. And all of those pistons, again with a, a viscous liquid inside of them, all of those pistons are going to absorb some of the energy that the earth is transferring to the building frame. Uh, and the, those pistons will take up the difference between the moving building frame and the steady tuned mass damper. Right? And that will prevent some of the motion uh, at the top of the building uh, that, that an earthquake would cause. The other way that we can do this is to actually isolate the building from the ground. So we rely on the inertia of the building frame itself to stay in one place in space while the ground is kind of going crazy uh, under it. Um, passive isolation systems are, in principle, really, really simple. Um, they're basically these rubber, they almost look like tires, and we put the building structure on top of these kind of rubber tires and we rely on the ductility of those rubber isolators to uh, dampen again the, the force of the earth moving and to isolate the moving earth 
from the building frame that again wants to stay in the same place uh, in one in, uh, in in space. Now, in theory, uh, that's really simple. Uh, in practice, of course, this is super difficult because we not only have columns that want to sit on footings, but we also have walls uh, that very often are doing the job not only of holding the exterior of the building up, uh, but also very often keeping soil or keeping water from getting into a basement. So these are uh, take an awful lot of coordination, both with the foundation design, but also with things like waterproofing, utilities, plumbing, things like that, right? Because we're, we're uh, allowing a differential movement between the, the earth uh, and a, a building basement where a lot of these services often come out and connect interface with, uh, with uh, municipal services, things like that. So here, uh, a couple of strategies, uh, vibration control devices, viscous dampers, where um, we're allowing the building to move, but we're trying to dampen it. We're using the, um, the, 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 the resistance of the piston and this fluid to take up some of that energy, uh, or a friction damper where we're actually relying on the friction between uh, steel plates moving against one another uh, to absorb some of the energy of the earth moving underneath it. Um, here again, this is a, a, a typical installation. Here's a, a piston uh, with a viscous damper. You can see that it is put within what is a pretty solid moment frame, right? You can see the torque boxes uh, at the corners. So that's already a pretty stiff frame. And this clearly is designed to take up uh, any excess seismic forces that the, the frame itself can't handle. And then also the, the other way to think about this is to isolate the building frame using these seismic isolators. So here again, these kind of big rubber tires that we've propped the building uh, up on top of uh, and that we're relying on the, their capacity to both let the building move, but also to dampen, or sorry, to let the earth move, right? The building stays still, um, but to also dampen some of that differential movement. Uh, and here you see a, a base uh, isolator in action. And this is a, a huge bit of structure holding up, as you can see, a, a very, very heavy uh, concrete frame above it. Um, those isolators are doing a lot of work, obviously, in compression, and they'll be asked to do a lot of work in shear as well. You can imagine the shear forces uh, of the earth moving in a fairly heavy building frame on top, uh, trying to stay in the same place. So to finish up, I want to talk about a case study that, uh, that I actually worked on that's kind of um, through the looking glass, right, that highlights some of these seismic issues uh, because it was a building that had to kind of break the rules. Um, this was a laboratory that uh, we designed for Stanford University for the medical school there. The site uh, is two miles from the San Andreas Fault, so basically as, as challenging a seismic zone as you can get uh, in the continental U.S., and we initially went into it thinking, well, of course, it's going to be a, a steel building. We'll make it very ductile. We'll make it very flexible. That's the way to, to, to make a safe building uh, in such an intense seismic zone. And very quickly, what we found out was that that wasn't possible because researchers in the laboratories used such sensitive equipment, scanning electron microscopes, uh, laser balances, things like that. They couldn't work with the vibration that would uh, happen if the building was made out of steel. So right away, we realized that we have to build a, a concrete frame. And this is, of course, uh, against every bit of seismic wisdom uh, that we know, right? It's gonna be a heavy building. It's gonna be a very stiff building. Um, and we, we, we're not gonna have any way to let the building kind of bend instead of break. Our engineers, Arabs, came back and said, we can make this work, but the, the walls are gonna have to be super thick this is a five-story building, and they said they wanted 18-inch concrete shear walls, which is enormous for a, a building that's that low. And they said also, just like we were talking about with wind resistance, that they wanted it to be evenly spread throughout the building. So our structural scheme, as you can see here, relied on these 18-inch shear walls being spaced regularly around every lab module. So you can see in the north-south direction, uh, these are around offices and conference rooms that look into a courtyard. And then in the east-west direction, these are around core spaces that hold uh, equipment. And what this meant was that we could put 
Uh, all of the seismic resistance, all of these heavy shear walls in fairly contained areas, and we could let the laboratories, which you see here and here, uh, open up, that we didn't need that stiffness to be on the outside uh, of, of, of the building. Um, during construction, you can see that this feels like an enormously heavy building because the, the, the walls are so thick. Um, they're being asked to do such a, a tremendous job against uh, seismic loads. Um, and there were some other kind of interesting things that came up during the design. We wanted to connect these two wings of the building with, uh, with steel bridges. And at some point, our engineers realized that there were some there was sometimes some earthquakes where both wings of the building would be uh, behaving in concert, right? Moving with the same periodicity. But they could come up with scenarios where the buildings would actually be moving uh, out of sync. So they'd be moving closer to one another and then farther away from one another. And what they were worried about was when the buildings moved farther away from each other, they would take the bridges that we had care so carefully designed and just rip them apart. So you can see that what we have here, the bridges uh, all sit on these, what are called friction pendulums. And they work basically like base isolators uh, in, a, in a foundation design. Um, they have a, a, a Teflon peg and a dish made out of stainless steel. And in an earthquake, the bridge, because it's got some uh, inertia to it, is gonna wanna stay in the same place in space and the two wings can move however they want, 8, 10, 12 inches, um, without pulling the bridge apart, right? The bridge is actually just resting. It's actually on a, a roller connection. You might remember we talked about those uh, in, the, in the last lecture. Um, here are the, the finished uh, product, and you can see that we exposed the shear walls, the ends of the shear walls. Um, there's a kind of psychology to this where if you live in a seismic zone, uh, you like to see kind of uh, where the, the structure actually is. And you can see here those bridges that uh, taper up before they uh, end up going into the building and sitting on those shelves. We have a steel and aluminum sunshade over the courtyard that sort of goes over the parapet. And that also sits on friction pendulums. Uh, because again, as the buildings maybe are whipping back and forth, we want, wanted that uh, courtyard roof to stay in the same place and to have the support without being kind of linked to the buildings uh, in, the, in the lateral direction. The, the, the bridges and that uh, courtyard screen all tend to stay in the same place in space while the buildings are going crazy underneath them. Um, and then interestingly enough, so here in the laboratories, we uh, again exposed the shear walls, uh, giving some kind of uh, comfort to, um, to the occupants in the event of an earthquake. Um, here you can see the view from the bridges, and you can just see those friction pendulums up there. Um, interestingly, we ran into a problem at the very end of the project where um, the building went up for seismic review, and the uh, engineers who reviewed it thought that uh, the building would be uh, completely occupiable, uh, even in a 7.5 earthquake, so roughly the, the scale of Loma Prieta, uh, and that it would be survivable up to an 8.5 magnitude earthquake, which is extraordinarily high, larger than, uh, than anything that the Bay Area has ever had. They came back to us, though, and they said that their problem wasn't with the building structure, but their problem was actually with the bookshelves that we had put in conference rooms and offices. Because the building is so stiff, because the, the concrete frame is so stiff, they said it'll survive the earthquake no problem. It will handle these tremendous shear forces well because the, the walls are so thick. But they said the building is going to accelerate so fast as the earth moves, right? The building's going to move exactly with the earth. There's no dampening. There's no isolation. And the earth can whip back and forth at 30 or 40 miles an hour. The problem, they said, is that now the building inertia isn't going to keep it still. The inertia of heavy books on the shelves are going to keep them in one place in space while the building is moving back and forth around it. And they were actually worried about the books becoming missiles and flying across an office uh, and hitting an occupant uh, in, a, in a seismic event. So not that the building is going to fall down and, and injure someone, but that the books are actually going to fly off and injure someone. And of course, what they were worried about wasn't what was going to do it. They were worried that someone could get hurt in a big earthquake. So we had to come back and we actually had to specify guardrails for all of the bookshelves 
in all of the offices uh, and conference rooms. Bit of an abject lesson in what happens when you kind of go off the rails, uh, pursue a, a, a seismic design in this case that kind of breaks the rules and how that very often comes back uh, and bites you, not in the design of the structure, but in this case, uh, actually in the design of the furnishings. When we uh, do our next lecture, uh, it will be on high-rise design. And as we'll see, the, the combination of gravity and lateral forces when we get buildings that are uh, very tall, so upwards of 15, 20 stories, all the way up to 50, 60, 100 stories, we'll see that these two lateral forces play important roles in how we pick structural systems and also how we lay those structural systems out in conjunction with the kind of functions and stuff that we want uh, with skyscrapers. So we'll take some of the principles that we've discussed here, uh, particularly looking at shear walls and cores, but also looking uh, at, at the way that we handle these two very different lateral loads and how those work with gravity loads when we're building tall uh, and, most interestingly, when we're building uh, super tall.